Gambia's 58th Independence Anniversary was a milestone worthy of celebration for different reasons and indeed it was celebrated in style. In recent years, Gambia has been in the forefront of the global news headlines for reasons that His Excellency the President sees as an inalienable right, self-determination and exercise of our sovereign right. President Jame is controversial to many of his critics, but the average Gambian see him as a populist who wants nothing but the best for his people, from the quality of food they eat, the schools they attend, the hospitals that look after them, and the roads they travel on. A staunch populist with glittering pan-Africanist credentials, President Jame cares less how the West perceives him and his mantra is, so long as I'm God-fearing and doing right by my people, I care less what labels are attached on me. His vision of Gambia is a country that will eradicate food and economic poverty but also emancipate the mind of the Gambian to believe that we can do it with or without outside financial intervention and he has definitely made headways on this venture by working towards 2016 food self-sufficiency. A man that is reminiscent of Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore who transformed a desolate island to a hub for global commerce. Waka J of Ben TV has been accorded the privilege to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with His Excellency the President. Stay tuned for some thought-provoking sound bites on burning issues. <laughs> Excellency, thank you so much for granting us at Ben TV UK, the audience, despite your busy schedule. This once again has demonstrated your symbolic gesture of openness towards all Gambians, and we congratulated you and all Gambians on the nation 50th. Your Excellency, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Your Excellency, how did you celebrate Gambia on our 50th anniversary? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين فاصل فلا أنت تانك بن تي في for trying to showcase the reality and the truth about the Gambia and my administration and not only Gambia but what's happening in Africa because only you Africans can tell the true story about Africa without any element of racism or bias. Thank you for also attending the 50th anniversary celebration. I'm rather surprised you asked me how did I celebrate it when you were here. Uh, I, cel I celebrated it with a great sense of achievement, but also uh, with a great sense of uh, the fact that uh, despite our ach tremendous achievements in 20 years, we still have challenges to face. Uh, because of the objective of bringing Gambia to, from this developed country to a superpower, economic superpower status, which of course we've now put a fixed time frame, and that is by 2025. So within 10 years, Gambia should achieve that, and that's not a, a small assignment, and I'm not also a politician, I don't say things I'm not going to do. Mm -hmm. So, but overall, uh, we celebrated with Gambians and friends of the Gambia, and of course, good Gambians in the diaspora who came, and other, of course, other people from different countries like the United States of America uh, and Africa as well. Uh, we celebrated it in grand style because when, and I have good reasons to celebrate, and every Gambian, and any truthful human being for that matter, has a lot to celebrate. Because Gambia, as we celebrated 50 years, we also we were reminded that the existence of Gambia is not 50, only 50, past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Gambia for 400 years was under British rule. Mm -hmm. And if you put 400 years of British rule, or sometimes some people say, oh, it was less than 400 years, whatever the case may be. If you add the period that the British were here, and the time that uh, uh, plus 30 years of uh, the First Republic, all the development, if there were any developments, mm -hmm. that took place in this country were dwarfed by my 20 years development agenda. Mm -hmm. And so if you are talking about uh, 
I think Africans are no longer fools. If you are talking about democracy, what is democracy? Yeah, the people vote regularly. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can fix or rig the elections in the government. You know the system. Mm -hmm. We are the only country in, in the whole world that has that system of uh, elections. Mm -hmm. And many people tell me, you cannot rig. And I say, I don't need to rig the elections. Mm -hmm. I want to know when my people want me in and when they want me out. And if they want me out, I go. If they want me in, I, I, I stay. Mm -hmm. I'm a servant of the people. So, the whole regular election. But if democracy is anything to go by, democracy means people living in freedom. Mm -hmm. In freedom, in peace and security, and in development. Now, and the fact that they are also ably represented in the affairs of the state, be it in the National Assembly, or uh, the judiciary, or the, the, the executive branch, which we have done for the past 20 years. Now, you know, yeah, Gambia. Mm -hmm. You know, in those days, maybe you once carried a chair on your head mm -hmm. or a desk to go to school. Mm -hmm. Today, that is not happening. In those days also, uh, your parents must, must be very wealthy or must be very close to the system mm -hmm. for you to have a university education. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in the history of this country, people start from undergraduate, receive a bachelor's degree, whether in science or uh, arts, mm -hmm. go to a master's degree, mm -hmm. and then proceed to PhD level, mm -hmm. all at the expense of my government. This is the first time. In the Gambia today, going to university is not determined by who your parents are or where you come from. Mm -hmm. It depends on your academic qualifications, period. We don't even look at your the background of your uh, your related uh, parents are uh, political background, mm -hmm. you know, and this was very rampant under Jawara's government, <coughs> where if you are NCP, a supporter of NCP, your children may not even go to high school because government high school we are only two. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> if democracy is anything to go by, Gambians today have more access to, uh, in fact, have better living conditions than at any time they would have dreamt of during the time of the British or 30 years ago. So we have a lot to celebrate and we are still celebrating by inaugurating projects. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and these are not small projects, these are multi-million dollar projects, mm -hmm. which is also unprecedented in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to celebrate. And uh, as I said, uh, when you look at the, uh, the Human Development Index, when we came in 1994, Gambia was very low down in the uh, uh, rank of nations. Today we are very up. We are up here. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you look at it, uh, today Gambia can be counted among maybe the first five African countries. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, that was not possible. Nobody even talked about Gambia. Yes. So here, whatever is here is for everybody, as opposed to before when it was for a selected few. Yes. Unique colonialism, the British took all the best. And the re remnant will be to those that were loyal to Britain, and then the rest goes back. Uh, uh, when maybe one person goes to the development of the country. So we have a lot to celebrate. Yeah. Since we are celebrating our 50th, um, if you were to compare 300 or more years of British rule and um, 30 years of the Fourth Republic and 20 years of the government, how would you compare? <laughs> You see, it's like uh, living under British rule. They were taking on back to this pre-stone age mm -hmm. because it's it's not that they came to develop the Gambia. Remember, Gambia also was bigger. Gambia was bigger than it is today, and what attracted the British to the Gambia was the trade in ivory, because Gambia uh, was the source of ivory trade and also was a center of trade in West Africa where the river Gambia played a very important role. Now, the amount of years that the British spent, 400 years anyway, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. let them, can you believe that the British that are talking about democracy, 400 years in the Gambia, they never built a national assembly. Yes, they never built any institution 
that will ensure democracy or the participation of Gambians in the administration of the, their own country. That is one. There is nowhere that any building is, was left to us. And celebrating 50 years is the first time we are opening the National Assembly in a, uh, in a National Assembly that's built by the government of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes. So if I were to comp uh, there's no way, there's no way you can compare the two. It's like, oh yes, it, there is a way. It's like the deepest part of hell and the middle class of heaven. That's the way you can compare it. Because how many, 400 years, they didn't train 10, 000, uh, even 10 scientists in this country, Gambian, indigenous Gambian. They didn't train Gambian doctors. Let them show me records. The colonial administration never trained Gambian, so go beyond Clark. So, what did they build for us? Because the state house was built by the Portuguese, the quadrangle was built by the Portuguese. All so-called colonial buildings were never built by the British. The only thing built by the British was the prison. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So, what type of administration, what type of government, uh, what was it that they wanted for the Gambia? Anything that they can loot. Okay. Then, at Whatever we have in this country, we never benefited from. Mm -hmm. Now, let, them t let the British government tell me. They said they were mining aluminite in Batokunga and other. Up to now, the pits are there. Mm -hmm. When they were closing, they burnt all the books and the, all the equipment were blown up. Mm -hmm. Now, up to today, they have not given the, any government of the Gambia the statistics of, if it was aluminite, the quantities taken, how much revenue it generated, and who benefit from the revenue. So, whereas whatever we do today, despite the fact that we are called all sorts of names, mm -hmm. which I'm proud of, mm -hmm. because when you stand up to them, they call you a dictator. I'm proud of that title. Mm -hmm. I'm a dictator that makes sure that my people don't go hungry. Mm -hmm. I'm a dictator that makes sure that every citizen of this country is educated, irrespective of the political <coughs> affiliation of the, of the parents. I'm a dictator of development in this country, and I'm proud of if even if they make it negative, I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. Because what Gamb Gambians are not fools. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what they have now, nobody ever dreamt of having it. Here we are in Kanila. People of Kanila never dreamt of tap bone water. Yes. Most of the think of electricity. Go to Janjambure, go to any most, all the villages in Sierra and Yara. Go to any part of the country today. Mm -hmm. We are making sure that 98 percent of all the uh, in fact, the criteria we use is that before, we say from 1,000 or 700 plus, the town should have electricity. Mm -hmm. Now we reduce it to 450. Now phase three that is coming is any town that has about 300 inhabitants would have electricity and water. Mm -hmm. Now, if the British did what we did, in f let's say for 400 years, if the British did what we, we my government did in 20 years, Gambia would have been a heaven, mm -hmm. plus 30 years of job. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen the coastal roads, all the other projects that have been implemented. Of course, as a Gambian, uh, I remember in 93 when I went to the States mm -hmm. for a military course, and it was then uh, Sabina, I think, uh, Brussels, yeah, mm -hmm. and Sabina. And uh, we took off. Now, when we were coming home, there was an American on the, <coughs> on the flight. And uh, I talked so big about the Gambia. And when the plane was going down, then the guy said, are we crashing? I said, what do you mean? There are no lights. Why is this? Where, what is going on? So, but the guy, we are landing at Yundum International yeah. Airport. <laughs> he, we are right yeah. there. Yeah, and then, he looked at it and said, where's the airport? I said, London. I said, this is what you call the airport? I said, yes, this is an airport. And that marked me. And I, keep, and I made sure that if I, if, I, um, if I take over this country, mm -hmm. in whatever, either elected or whatever, mm -hmm. I'll make sure that the airport will be the first thing I address, because these are first impressions. Mm -hmm. uh, the former president, when he was pardoned and he came, and he landed he, at 4 a.m., I sent some people to receive him, a black hijab and other. And when he saw Banjo International Airport, he thought it's Bongi in Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. So he asked the guy, 
Why didn't you wait for me in the Gambia? I said, yeah, we are in the Gambia. I said, no, but why Bongi? This is Bongi International Airport. I said, no, this is the airport. That's all. That is your terminal building. The contractor, and this is the new terminal building and the contractor. He couldn't believe it. And then, I think the following day, he was so curious about it, about the development, that he had to arrive on the coastal roads of Kolkata. You know. So, what, as I said, the British, I used to say they, they, they built only two high schools, only to realize that in fact those high schools were never built by them in the first place. Now like the Gambia Senior Secondary School, or Gambia High School, was formerly Methodist Boys High School, which was not built by the British government. Then Amitage was started as a teacher to the tribal uh, traditional rulers wanted to build a school on their own for, the, for their children. And then it was taken up and made a high school. I think it was after independent that it was made a high school. So uh, actually, Amitage High School, both Amitage High School and uh, Gambia High School were never, never built by the British government. But also now, during the 400 years that they were here, how many schools were built in Britain by his or her majesty's government, various governments? They built a lot. So that's what education, for us, education doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. So we should stop at, uh, John is my, my, my boy, I sent him to school to learn how to spell John Bull, how to write John Bull or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, if I stay in your house, and uh, whatever, then I overpower you and then take control of your house. Mm -hmm. All the good food I take it to my family outside, to my village, mm -hmm. and leave you only with anything that is that I do not want and my family doesn't want. Mm -hmm. And then now you take over. You, see, you kick me out and say, "Okay, now I'm in charge." Can I come back and tell your family that you are, you are a dictator? You feeding your family, you giving them dignity, you giving them respect, you making sure that everybody has equal access to all the opportunities, including academic opportunities, educational opportunities. I mean, I, maybe you're too young to know, but I know times when we go to the hospital, we go Royal to the Victoria. Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital, only for you to, even to see the doctor for prescription was a problem. Now they give you prescription and then refer you to uh, pharmacies owned by the same people that are high up in government. And that's why they say, uh, uh, you know why high real? They say you go there to die. <laughs> Do you understand? Yes. But why was it so bad after independence? Mm -hmm. Because there was nothing even during independence. When we took over the system, there, was, there were only two doctors, in, trained doctors in the public system. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was an ophthalmologist that I know about because, because we used to use candles so much mm -hmm. for studies that my eyes used to be very brown or red. Mm -hmm. So I'm always, then they started being itchy so I was referred to RBTH, uh, uh, Victor, uh, uh, Royal, Royal Victoria Hospital, because that was the only place where the eye specialist was for the public. Mm -hmm. And I had to go three days. Each time I went there, I found a queue there, and I had to go back for classes. Mm -hmm. And I had to go and come back. And one day the lady was a German. She came out and said, oh, you are the student who has been coming from Gambia? I said, yes. I said, OK, come. So I went in. and. And, then, and I felt so bad, and I looked at those people because I, re I remember two of them, I met them before. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling very bad that I had to go in first. And it, the lady said, no, you come in first because you are a student, but after I'll take care of him. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt so bad. Okay, passport. Mm -hmm. To get a passport, how was it? So, now, 400 years, they built only two hospitals. No college, no high school. Mm -hmm. So, assume that, okay, Amitage belongs to them and Gambia. Mm -hmm. For 400 years for two high schools, isn't that an insult? Mm -hmm. And two hospitals. And also remember that in 1945, Banjul, which was the capital, mm -hmm. or Batos as it were called, mm -hmm. the living, uh, the life expectancy was 25 years for Gambians until President Roosevelt 
was shocked about what he saw in this country. So if the capital was that bad, can you imagine the interior? If the people in the capital were starving, if the capital is called a hellhole, what about the villages? And how was London as a capital compared to a colony? And most of the resources were taken from this country. There are also instances, in fact, the same report stated that uh, the, the whatever is produced, uh, the, the revenue collected was taken out of the country mm -hmm. and not used for the development of the Gambia. And uh, let me also tell you something I discovered that shocked me and that will shock you too. Mm -hmm. You see, the, there was a deal with the French that the French wanted Gambia and they wanted to give uh, Britain, I think, uh, Gabon or another country in exchange. And since they started negotiating that, the British thought that there was no reason to, develop, to put any development in the Gambia mm. after they were going to give it, sell it to the French. Can you believe? Our own country. No, Gambia was consulted. Mm. And that's why also today most Gambians don't know. Mm. So where's the democracy? You come to my country. You take all what is good. And up to today, they've not told us how much revenue was generated by mining. You tell, you tell me today, I've done so much, I've built so many. Uh, Gambia is a modern country, you call me a dictator. But that's a, a blessing, you know? You know, when you look at crops, if you want them to yield better, you don't, you don't put them in a clean place, right? You need fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So all the bad things they say is fertilizer for me because if they are sham shameful, they shouldn't have said anything about any African country up to today. What is more dictatorial than for me to come and uh, occupy your country and force my culture on you, force my language on you, and everything that is good, I take it home. What, what is more dictatorial than colonialism? Yes. So imagine if, let's say every 10 years, they, they tr uh, maybe train five doctors. At the time of independence, when the, Gam the size of the government, we wouldn't have required foreign doctors. Sir, so, um, education, agriculture, and health are three key sectors are very dear to you. Um, what changes can we expect from now to 10 years time? Wow. Uh, well, with regards to, OK, for it, uh, let me start with agriculture, because alphabetical also is here. <laughs> Uh, with agriculture, we want in ten years we'll be exporting by the grace of the Almighty Allah, and by next year we're going to end of December 2016. We're not importing any basic food commodity into this country. We want to make sure that whatever we consume in this country is produced in this country. But we want to go further than that. We want to in ten years from now we want to be a highly industrialized agricultural country, because the problem here is that. Uh, as long as Africans, African farmers and even African government, exp whatever we export is in the rock, it's not uh, value added, we're not, going to, we're not going to get out of poverty. So you realize that uh, agro-processing is very important because no matter what we discover in this country or what, no matter what minerals we exploit in this country or in other natural resources, agriculture will be a cardinal pillar in my development. Well, even if you produce diamonds, uh, nobody cooks diamonds. So even if you have money, there will come a time when you may even have money and nobody will want to exp export something to you because nobody knows, because food is, is now a weapon. Mm -hmm. So agriculture will also be modernized. Uh, industrialization, in fact, is the key. Ten years from now, if you come to the Gambia, you see industrialization. Also, uh, it regards to education, we want to do. Uh, we want to be as independent as possible in terms of educating our people. Uh, that does not mean that uh, we will not be sending students overseas, mm -hmm. but we realize that it is cheaper to train them at home. So we will have collaboration with other universities, but we want to have at least five universities in ten years. A university, of course, that will specialize in agriculture, the PhD level. 
a university of science and technology where anybody from any part of the world will come up for training. And uh, uh, sciences, as you know, this is why we, in 10 years' time, we, we cannot have uh, space scientists if you want to. And, uh, but whether it is in the Gabi or not, we would have specialists in all fields of endeavor in terms of academy, in scientific research, technology, and engineering. Yes. And uh, then you talk about education. Uh, as I said, we will have, you know, now we train our own doctors. We have our own lawyers, law school. But we want to make sure that systematically, by 10 years from now, a Gambia would only go out for maybe PhD upwards, uh, uh, mas uh, for master's degree in any uh, field, they will not need to go out. So my objective is that uh, people can go out only for maybe PhD level, doctorate level, and then maybe other uh, practical experience and attachments in 10 years from now. Yes. Mm -hmm. We, we, all know your, we all know your credentials as a sound pan Africanist and an anti imperialist champion. Um, uh, what can you tell us about Gambia moving forward with or without the help of Western donors? As I celebrated the 50th uh, anniversary with my. With or without what? Western the help of. <laughs> Western donors. Western aid. Wow. That, that has never been part of my vocabulary, you know. Mm. Uh, okay, let's say what, the EU. The, the EU, uh, I think it's the only Western institution I can remember. Mm. But let me tell you one thing. I've never depended on that, and Gambians know that. If I have depended on them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't reach where we are today. And I can raise my hand in Africa or in the third world. And uh, let me be challenged by anybody to say, I've done more than you in 20 years, even natural resources and out countries. You know, the Western aid is not even aid. It's an insult. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were honest, if they could be honest enough and godly enough to say, for 400 years, out of every pound that we took from the Gambia, we'll give you back maybe 20 pence. We will be wealthier than Britain for 400 years multiplied. Mm -hmm. Every pound taken from this country. And of course, also there is a sent 5,000 pounds interest-free loan that was imposed on the Gambia in 1947. Mm -hmm. Up to now, that has not been paid. I've seen where Gambians go to the museum in Birmingham or where, where Gambian things are, some of them are classified. Mm -hmm. The war effort, Gambians were, Gambian civil servants were raised more money. When they say we need 400 pounds, Gambian civil servant will raise about 4,000 pounds. Do you understand? So, Western aid. <laughs> of course, there are countries that have never uh, colonized the Gambia. But also, they are all partners in crime. Because they also never objected to the other countries, the looting of Africa. So they, they all have African blood in their hands. Uh, so whatever they give to this country is nothing compared to what they've taken from this country. So am I grateful for what they've done? No, it's an insult. Because if I take, if you, if you take my bull and only give me the legs and the horns to eat in the form of aid, that's an insult. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes, so I don't need Western aid. My deve development, the development of this country is dependent on the Almighty Allah only. And I say it, um, and I say it, I've been repeating that. Mm -hmm. So, Western aid is nothing to me. That's why we say it. Because I don't need it and I don't have it. So, I, in whatever I say, uh, that is why whatever I say, I say, Inshallah, Allah willing. Mm -hmm. I'm not counting on any Western aid because it's an insult. They tell you, oh, we have, uh, now they are with the EU, they say, oh, 
We have 13 million dollars or euros. We are, we've blocked it. Why? Because you say no. They say, oh, I'm, I'm not uh, tolerant of minorities. Now they say homosexuals are minorities. <laughs> so they create a new creed of humanity and they call them a minority in this country. But why would you withhold 13 million euros from the, pop, uh, the majority because of the minority? You see how lopsided the ideology is? How evil it is? You can see how evil Western aid is. Because they give you any aid, there are strings attached to it. Sometimes they have, they have satellite, they've spied on every country, Geolog geophysical surveys, they've done that. So they know what you don't know in most cases. Thank God, I had seven times conducted all the surveys of this country using different various uh, companies in the world mm -hmm. to check from minerals to whatever, so I know what is here. But if you, if you, if you sit and wait for them, uh, I want to find out whether I have oil. They say, oh, they leave it to the private sector. So now they come and entice you. When your people are hungry, they come and say, oh, well, yes, uh, we're going to give you 30 million uh, euros aid. And you say, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Very much. They didn't even complete the study thanking them. Not knowing that there are so many hooks that you take the 30 million, you end up coughing out 13 billion pound, uh, euros to them. You don't know. Then they start saying, oh, my company, you have a company that's interested in doing some, maybe you have something, we just, they just want to check prospect. Oh, yes, 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 give the license. Say, okay, now what they do, the license, there are two phases to the license. One is the exploratory period, mm -hmm. and then the exploitation period. Now what they do, they lump the two in one, mm -hmm. And say for 35 years, because you think that in your jungle there's nothing, it's only the forest, and say, oh, look at these Europeans, they want to go on adventure. And then they say, 1.5% uh, royalty. So, oh, yes, yes, 1.5%. You don't even, how can you give me a percentage and not tell me of what? Mm -hmm. When you say 1.5%, of what? Africans don't ask that question. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So you have oil, they discover oil, and they start saying, the land you have signed for 35 years is not subject to review. Mm -hmm. They're not paying royalty, they're not paying anything. So out of every dollar, you have only 1.5. Out of every dollar, you have uh, how many cents? Okay, if it is 5%, it's 5 cents. Now, if it is 1.5, it's 1.5 cents. So how many years would it take you for this one, one and a half cent out of every hundred cents for you to build a road? They explore your country until the people start understanding and say, oh, no, 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 massive corruption. You see, I mean, you're producing hundred, um, <laughs> two million barrels a day. Ask the yeah, man, it's corruption, he's a dictator. And then your people, without even knowing, start clapping in the street. Mm -hmm. They have borne the little things I have done for the past maybe 10 years, 7 years. Oh yes, yeah, he must go, he's caught up, he's a dictator. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that when you've born what I have already done, mm -hmm. these guys are not coming back to do it. Mm -hmm. They want you to get poorer, poorer because they want to put in a puppet mm -hmm. that will give them what they want. Typical example, look at, they say, look at the Arab Spring. Arab Spring has b done nothing but mayhem for the Arab countries. Mm -hmm. They have destroyed all the Arab countries that they these were wealthy countries. These were at least countries where at least 40% of the youth were employed. Mm -hmm. They destroyed them, brought them back to the Stone Age, and today, going out of, to the market, you're not sure whether you're going to come back or not. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying. Look at Egypt. I've been to Egypt seven times. And when the so-called spring started, and started, I, looked at, I looked at the TV and told my wife, all these people dancing would, be, would end up crying or dead. Well, if they think that the West, after Mubarak is gone, who have, who have been an ally of the West for so many years, they turn around and stab him in the back. Mm -hmm. And after Mubarak is gone, Mubarak the dictator is gone, they're going to live in crystal palaces. They're making a big fool of themselves. Because then my wife said, okay, how? I said, they're dist destroying tourism. Millions of e Egyptians depend directly or indirectly on tourism, just like the Gambia. Mm -hmm. 
Tourism is a, an integral part of the Egyptian economy. They start advising that you don't go to Egypt because terror, now terrorism, bombing, instability. Look at Iraq. Look at Syria. Now, the same countries that talk about dictatorship and uh, who want democracy are now turning around, sponsoring those countries where in the 60s, if you talk about revolution, they lock you up. Mm. Are today talking about revolution. Sponsoring people to destroy their countries because there's something that they want, and when they get it, they don't care about how the people So Look at how many Syrians are dying of, 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 of cold weather. Mm -hmm. How many Syrians are starving? Ha have you ever had people starving in Syria before? Now, if they don't want Assad, uh, changed by the, by the barrel of the gun, is that necessary? If they thought they wanted democracy, if uh, Assad was not democratic, why didn't they sponsor opposition parties mm -hmm. to contest the elections? Mm -hmm. They, ha they have worse dictators, vampires than anywhere in the world. They are dictatorial. But they are not saying take up arms against us in order to... Most Western countries do not even serve the interests of their people. But if it were a Western country... Oh, now, look at the difference. Uh, in, Asa, in Syria, they are helping rebels. Anywhere else, they have helped rebels to destroy their country. Now, Ukraine is taboo for anybody to help the rebels. So where it's concerned, white and European, mm -hmm. violence shouldn't be the system of change of government or the system of settling disputes. Mm -hmm. But where it is black or Asian, yeah, violence, they, they help you with a huge arsenal and create uh, uh, death machines like ISIL. So in a nutshell, uh, democracy, development, Ten years from now, <laughs> by the great, you're talking about 2025? Mm -hmm. And I pray that we all live long enough to see that day. Maybe when you come here to interview me, I will say, so you Westerners looking for jobs in this country. Billahi mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. So it's not dependent on Western aid or anything. Yes. That's why we say it with or without them. No, in fact, I would prefer to develop without them because then, you see, they tell you to work. As you are working, they, they just try to, get you on the floor. yes, get you on the floor. Or they tell you to follow them. Now, if I ask you to follow me, would you ever be ahead of me? That's why Africa is backward because most African leaders follow them. And that's why they will never be ahead of European countries, despite the natural the resources we have. Okay, let me give you for example. When they tell you to follow them, mm -hmm. you consult them on anything that you want to do as a country. So you lose your sovereignty, you even lose your privacy. For example, they say, okay, we produce granules, so we want to process our own granules. I say, oh, leave it to the private sector. So the state, they have your hands tied behind your back and tell you, no, don't do this because if I process my granules, if you sell the granules as they are, you are selling only one product. That's the nut. But if you process it, you have four or five different byproducts that are all high value. Mm -hmm. The animal feed, the soap that you produce from it, the various things, chocolates or whatever you want to produce from it. But if you sell the granules, you're just selling one commodity. But when you process it, all the different components have a specified price. Now, for example, look at the African coffee producing countries put together. Mm -hmm. And look at one, I wouldn't name them, but you know all the co coffee processing companies, that coffee companies, right? Mm -hmm. Coffee or cocoa mm -hmm. companies. That means they buy the beans from Africa, and process them. Each one of them is wealthier than all the African cocoa and coffee producing countries put together. And they buy the coffee from Africa. For example, uh, 100 grams of, most of, uh, most of the tins are in 100 grams. Mm -hmm. 
or 250 grams. Now, a kilo of nuts, uh, the cocoa uh, beans, may not get a dollar. A kilo, that's 100 grams, uh, 1,000 1, grams. And then, each of the 100, out of 1,000 grams, now it is processed, the only process is roasting. Nothing else. There's nothing that most, most, there's in anything that is indispensable in coffee. It's a, just a question of maybe what you put there to, for it to be addictive to people so that the brand becomes addictive. Now, so out of one kilogram that you bought for, let's say, one dollar, they say three dollars per hundred, three, uh, hundred grams. How much would that be for a thousand, one, a thousand grams? Mm -hmm. So you, the guy who bought, all, in, all your suffering is going to buy, sip it, process it. Mm -hmm. And the African farmer that has bent in this African heat for seven months to produce it has only a dollar per kilo. And you have five dollars or ten dollars per kilo. Mm -hmm. So if we continue the status quo, we are producing to become poorer, mm. whilst the, the North is buying to become wealthier and wealthier. Mm. Now, okay, okay, also look at the oil companies. They are wealthier than the, comp the countries from which they extract the oil. Then something is fundamentally wrong. Mm. So if you depend on them, that's what you get. Yes. Imagine for 35 years, out of one dollar, mm. I get five, five cents. And the oil is mine, it's in my country. Mm -hmm. And we also know the cost of the rig, the cost of drilling the well. So, if, for example, let's say if it is, uh, uh, you start production by 200 barrels, barrels a day, mm -hmm. 200 barrels at $100. Mm -hmm. And then you spend less than a billion dollars on the infrastructure. Everything is less than $1 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, so, if you say, let's say, uh, a million barrels a day by 30, you talk about 30 million barrels. per month. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 years, 30 million. <laughs> so, in 10 years, you would have amortized whatever investment you put in so I see no reason why I should give you the license for 35 years and I'm only receiving five cents. It's not fair. But also what they do in order to blackmail us is they monopolize the technology. There are certain fields of study. If you send a Gambian to European universities, they will not let him study that field. But you can only study those fields in Asia today and other uh, parts of Africa. Because they want to monopolize that type of technology mm -hmm. so that we will always be dependent on them. Do you understand? Yes. So, uh, I'm not saying, it's, I don't, in fact, it is haram to depend on anybody. Mm -hmm. Independence of body, if he dies. Mm -hmm. It's only you are wise when you depend on the Almighty Allah who will never die, who will never sleep, who will never be sick. But it depends on somebody, especially somebody who's racist, mm -hmm. who believes that they are a black monkey. Is that a similar? Now, also Africans, especially you in the diaspora, mm -hmm. you should be very careful. Mm -hmm. When they set you to go and set your, your, uh, your countries on fire, mm -hmm. you know how difficult it is for you to, if, when you drive a, a nice car, mm -hmm. the, the police stop you mm -hmm. because you are black. Oh, yeah. And they check whether you've stolen it. Or maybe you have, maybe you have, you have married. They will always do something to embarrass you, to tell you that yeah. you don't belong yeah, here. Yeah. So now imagine if you have thousands of African refugees going to Europe, how will go? A typical example is the Liberian crisis. Mm -hmm. When Liberian refugees, 98% of the refugees have nowhere to go but to come to Africa. Mm -hmm. So the way they treat you there, and then they turn around and tell you that, oh, your government is not good. Can they mind their business? If their government was good, would they treat you with racism as a black man? After all, they came to Africa and said we are one and looted us. But we, the Africans, also have to wake up. Look at the countries that have followed the West, that they call the leaders of Africa. 
whose leaders, countries whose leaders are going, the leaders of Africa. I can raise my hand and say, okay, even with regards to students that I as a president sponsored, mm -hmm. they will not have sponsored that number in 50 years of their presidency. There are some heads of the who have not even sponsored five students in their entire presidential lifetime, except those who are related to them. From from uh, 94 to date, mm -hmm. I have sponsored more than 45,000 Gambians. And I have statistics, we have books, uh, we have the, we have in fact a data center, mm -hmm. where all of them, those who pass through my sponsorship system, are registered. Sometimes I go across someone and uh, they greet me in the public, uh, for example, at a meeting or during reception, and they think I know them. <laughs> Your Excellency, thank you. Say thank you for what. <laughs> so sometimes when I when somebody says thank you, and I ask for what they think that I'm being sarcastic. No, I want to know for what because I've never seen the face. And they say, oh, you sponsored? Ah, you don't know me. I say no. You paid for me to go to this particular university. I say, well, I, I had was a name with an academic qualification. There was no picture, and that is why now, when we sponsor anybody, when somebody writes. We have the picture so that tomorrow, because once I see the, the picture, mm -hmm. I, if I see you in public, I know that this is the guy. Because sometimes they feel like uh, embarrassed, yeah. and I don't, I, oh, I, I'm embarrassing people. Because somebody says thank you, and I say, well, thank you for what? Yeah. So I say, somebody, somebody will come, you saved my life. I say, well, how did I? Oh, you changed my life. How? Well, you don't know, you paid for me to go to this particular university, whatever, and I say, oh. At that time, I only saw a name yes. and qualification. Mm -hmm. So, my record speaks for itself. So, no matter what accolades they give me, mm -hmm. they can even call me whatever they want to call me, but I'm not that to my people. Mm -hmm. And the welfare of my Gambian people is what I care for. Yes. yes. But I can tell you the buzzword on the street uttered by the youth is Gambia, Demrek, and I'm sure you share that sentiment. Um, as a media outlet, Bill TV is a very dominant, has a dominant platform. We would like to share your views um, um, in celebrating our 50th, and we would like to hear, um, want to know what message do you have for Gambians in the diaspora, and uh, also that we heard about the ones that you have pardoned. We want you to enlighten us, sir. Uh, <laughs> the ones I have pardoned. Mm. Well, I, I pardoned them because they asked for pardon. Mm. But I ask, yeah. I'm not a vengeful person. As I said, even the Prophet his worst critics became his most uh, strongest generals that supported him. As a Muslim, if I will not forgive people, then I cannot call myself a Muslim. I don't believe in vengeance. They said all what they have to say. And they, they can continue to say it will not change my leadership. It will not change my outlook. They can let some ignorant people look at me negatively. I don't care. You understand? Mm -hmm. What I care about is the welfare of this country, <coughs> the welfare of Africans, mm -hmm. the socioeconomic emancipation of the African continent, and the black race. Mm -hmm. Today, you watch football, and then a, a good uh, black footballer runs to the side, and then they start chanting. They say they call it the monkey chant. Mm -hmm. Throwing bananas at them. Throwing bananas at them. But at least the monkey is more intelligent. Mm -hmm. When pigs shout at you, mm -hmm. don't mind them. Yeah. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All this racism is inferior to the complex, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy that Africans ignore them. We're not competing for superiority. Mm -hmm. So why are they competing us? Mm -hmm. If they don't have a complex, why would they? T I asked one uh, European, uh, no, American racist, mm -hmm. when I was in the US, mm -hmm. I asked him, each time you wake up in the morning, do you have a pet? He said, yes. He said, what, what type of pet? He said, oh, a dog and a cat. I said, oh, so you have pets? He said, yes. So said, okay. Do you always tell the dog that every morning that you are, you are better than it? Mm -hmm. you see? He said, oh, it's a he. He said, oh, yeah. So you tell the dog that you are better than him. He said, it's a him. Yeah. He said, uh-huh. He said, no, why would I do that? I don't need to. Said, but if you tell the dog that you are higher than him, he said, no. 
It's all right because everybody knows I'm I'm superior to the dog. So good. <laughs> so if you are inferior to the dog, you tell the dog that you are superior, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other guy laughed and said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Exactly what you understand." Mm -hmm. So thank you for being racist. I took his hand <laughs> because if you if you were not if you are not carrying inferiority complex, mm -hmm. you wouldn't tell me that you are better than me. But do I care? I don't care. Mm -hmm. So you can go hang yourself. And if you think I'm a monkey, I think you're a pig. Mm -hmm. And that's why you hide in that stupid hood called uh, Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. If you are proud of what you're doing, why would you hide your face? Mm -hmm. And I say, and you are so stupid that you are using the, the swastika. The symbol of your supremacy is black. So if you are wearing black, black goggles, you say, oh, uh, why supremacy? You're wearing black, I'm black. Mm -hmm. And this is your uniform of supremacy, then you are stupid. Or you wear uh, white, white, like the KKK, mm -hmm. uh, but you hide yourself. Something is wrong with you. I says, Hitler in his madness. And I said, do you know also where this swastika came from? It's from India. And it's not a symbol of racism. I said, you see how confused you are? Even Hitler thought that even white Europeans were not white and they must be Aryan. Mm -hmm. But then the swastika is black. Mm -hmm. Now if I if I think that I'm superior to white, my symbol of supremacy would not be white. But superior, so what? Superior to who for what? You all die, we all get sick, we all walk and talk. But as I said, he told me that he, will, he never told his dog that he's superior because the dog knows. And everybody knows that he's superior to the dog. He doesn't need to tell him. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, so then why tell him blacks yeah. that you are superior? So which means you know you are lower than them. Mm -hmm. And let the scientists find out who is higher and lower. Mm -hmm. lower. Mm -hmm. But that is irrelevant. As a Muslim, you cannot be racist. A good Christian also will never be racist. But unfortunately, you see, people hiding behind Christianity, like in the U.S., the so-called evangelists who are racist talk about supremacy. Supremacy in what? Jesus Christ that they that they talk about it was a Jew. Mm -hmm. The same people that call themselves Christians, evangelicals, mm -hmm. hate the Jews and the blacks. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ was Jewish. Mm -hmm. that, isn't that confusion? It's a state of mind. But you see, uh, not long ago the caricature another president. See, that is a chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. Yes. What? Yeah, it's a chimpanzee. Well, if a chimpanzee is your president, then you are a pig. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying. But, you see, uh, I like one footballer. He, they threw a banana at him and he ate it. He ate it, yeah. Was it John Vance? To show them that he is more intelligent than they are. If a monkey is playing for any English team. A monkey will only play in a team of monkeys, so they are also monkeys. Mm -hmm. And if, if human beings can watch monkeys play football, then they are also monkeys. Mm -hmm. They are so stupid that they don't know what they are saying. But it's a matter, it's a co inferiority complex. You understand? Now, they hate you so much there. Why do you think they would like you here? After all, colonialism, they didn't come to develop, they came to loot. Mm -hmm. If you understand? Yeah. Coming back to your point. So we have so much to celebrate these 50 years. Because what I've done in 20 years supersedes a million fold what the British didn't do. Because they didn't do anything. I cannot say what they did in the Gambia. All they did in the Gambia was to loot. OK, uh, look at the Gambia before you left. How many story buildings were in this country? When we took over, there were only 35, uh, 35 air conditioners in the country. Mm. Government mm. air conditioners. Mm. And you know the whole time where they make a hole in the wall? Yes. How many people have electronic typewriters? Today, go around. OK, the highway has lights. There were no lights. That, in that case, it has also enhanced the livelihood of Gambians. Because with the lights, there are fewer accidents than before. 
So if you say, oh, it's a dictator, the country is being spoiled. Oh, that's not democracy. Who, <coughs> who eats democracy? The British were here for 400 years. They never practiced democracy. They never allowed Gam one Gambian to represent the Gambia in the British parliament. For 400 years. Now they come by and tell me democracy. I've built a national assembly. And all the regions of this country are represented in the national assembly. And we, the development here is is equal uh, equal opportunities for all Gambians. Today, whether you are in Kwena or what, uh, you, you enjoy the same electricity that somebody in Saraguna is, is enjoying. That's what democracy is all about. Good governance. Where not the elite go to school or education is for the elite or better medical care is for the elite. Here, the medical care is for everybody. Yes. Education is for everybody. By 20. 25, 10 years from now, when you come, you may have more graduates than UK and employed also. Decently employed. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.